When you think about it, governments are a fascinating example of the choices humans have made to improve the quality of their lives. It is believed that governments first evolved when people discovered they could protect themselves from one another and from the threat of outside groups if everyone within their group chose to allow one or a few of them more power than the rest. These select few individuals would create and enforce a set of rules to ensure law and order, and would work to protect the group from outside forces. Since that time, what constitutes more power than the rest has been a grand experiment, to say the least. Amongst the hundreds of attempted governments, a handful have risen up to make a lasting impact on our world some with more success than others. Monarchy, democracy, dictatorship. Let's see how they work. What is a dictatorship and how does it work? The next form of government on our list is the dictatorship. In a dictatorship, one person has absolute power with no constitutional restraints. They answer to no one as their power is unlimited and uncontrolled. This might sound familiar, as a true monarchy operates much in the same way. However, there is one fundamental difference between a dictatorship and a monarchy, and it is usually a violent one. Unlike a monarchy, where we know rule is inherited, passed down from generation to generation, Dictators come to power through a military takeover of the government, through rebellions, or when an elected ruler refuses to step down from their office. Imagine, for a moment, what would happen if one day the mayor of your town decided not to leave after someone else was elected to do his or her job. And then imagine if that same mayor gathered together an army and decided he or she would not only refuse to step down from their elected office, but also make all the decisions affecting people's lives, regardless of existing governmental rules and regulations or the will of the people. As strange as it may sound, that is just what dictators do. One of the most famous examples of dictators in history is the ancient Roman ruler Julius Caesar. Caesar raised an army and overthrew the Roman Empire, the most powerful government in the world at that time. And on February 14th, 44 BCE, he was made dictator for life. And to give you a little idea how much power a dictator can have, even though Caesar was assassinated just one month later, in 42 BCE, the Roman Senate declared him a god in the Roman religion. Although there are examples throughout history of dictators like Caesar, modern dictatorships began in the 19th century. As a number of countries in Latin America were freed from Spanish colonial rule, various self-proclaimed leaders rose up, raised private armies, and then marched on governments now weakened by no longer having the military support of Spain behind them. Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna in Mexico and Juan Manuel de Rosas in Argentina are just two examples of men who became dictators in the Americas. But it wasn't until the 20th century that dictatorship came to serious national prominence. Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany, Benito Mussolini's Italy, and Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union all came to power in the first half of the 20th century and they were responsible for the deaths of millions of people. The devastation they caused was so overwhelming that it is still difficult to calculate. In the mid 20th century, Mao Zedong, another dictator, unified China and is directly and indirectly thought to have been responsible for the death of between 40 and 70 million people. In the last 15 years, while they were alive, Muammar Gaddafi from Libya and Saddam Hussein from Iraq were both considered dictators. And today, China, North Korea, and Cuba are just three of the estimated 
50 governments in the world ruled by a dictatorship. Let's review. Question one. In a dictatorship, the ruler or dictator, A, shares governing responsibility with a parliament, B, answers to no one. Their power is unlimited and uncontrolled. C, only has total power in Eastern European principalities. D, none of the above. The answer is B. A dictator answers to no one and their power is unlimited and uncontrolled. Question number two. True or false? Not only was Julius Caesar appointed dictator for life by the Roman Senate, after his death, they declared him a god in the Roman religion. The answer is true. The Roman Senate declared Julius Caesar dictator for life in 44 BCE and a god in the Roman religion in 42 BCE. Question number three. How many countries are currently considered to be ruled by a dictatorship? Is it A, 15, B, 25, C, 50, D, 65? The answer is C. China, North Korea, and Cuba are just three of the estimated 50 governments in the world considered to be ruled by a dictatorship. I'm in, I'm in charge, charge now, now and, and I'm, I'm going, going to tell, tell you what, what to do. Okay, maybe not, but if you would kindly listen for a minute as I explain dictatorships, that would be great. A dictatorship is a form of government in which all the power lies within one person. Some power can be shared with others close to the dictator, but the overwhelming majority of power resides with that one person. Dictatorships are notorious for being scary, evil, and dangerous, but they still exist today. If it sounds like a monarchy, that's because the two forms of government have a lot of similarities. However, there are some characteristics that set the two forms of government apart. Dictators tend to take power and not let go. They don't look out for their people's best interests, whereas a monarch does, or at least is supposed to. A dictator may claim that's what they're doing, but their actions usually tell the truth. In fact, they usually take a different title because they don't like being called a dictator. One of the most well-known examples of this being in World War II, when German dictator Adolf Hitler was referred to as the Führer, meaning guide or leader. Hitler ordered the murders of millions of Jews, including citizens of his own country. Living in a dictatorship doesn't sound pleasant, so you may be wondering, how do they start and how do they stick around? There are plenty of ways dictators have risen to power, but a large number of them result from violence, taking advantage of a need for change in the country. In times of need, countries will sometimes give up authority to a singular leader for a time in order to settle a problem quickly. While it may have been the intention to be temporary, dictators can take advantage of this power in certain instances and hold on to it. Dictators hold on to their power by suppressing their people. They limit rights and only allow people to have information that they want them to know. This can include propaganda. Propaganda is any misleading information that's used to promote a political cause or view. This can be anything from lies about a country's well-being to fictional stories about a dictator and their supposed greatness. Because of these reasons, it can become confusing when a country is truly a dictatorship. Normally, outside countries will be the ones to label nations as dictatorships because of the lack of influence dictators have on citizens other than their own. Some of the most notable dictatorships have sprouted up in just the last hundred years. During and after World War II, the world couldn't help but focus on the cruel and unbelievably tragic dictatorships of Germany and Russia. Germany was controlled by the Nazi party, led by the aforementioned Adolf Hitler, and Russia was at the time known as the Soviet Union and controlled by Joseph Stalin. Numerous crimes against humanity occurred under both men's lead, and yet many were still led to believe that they were each great leaders who would bring prosperity to their respective countries. Still today, dictatorships continue to rule over various nations without truly being recognized as one. Some use different labels, such as communist state, to distinguish themselves from being a dictatorship. As history shows with all forms of government, it's important to be aware of government officials and know when they have abused their power. What is a monarchy? 
and how does it work? The most ancient form of governance that we know of is the monarchy. In a true monarchy, a single person rules the entire country, and that authority is generally inherited. Their titles may vary, but the most common associated with a monarchy are king, queen, emperor, or empress. Evidence has been found that identifies monarchies going back as far as 3150 BC with King Narmer in Egypt. That's over 5,000 years ago. The oldest continually ruling monarchy that we know of is Japan's Yamato Dynasty, which traces its origins back to 660, making it the oldest continuous hereditary monarchy in the world. Emperor Akihito has reigned there since 1989 and is thought to be the 125th emperor in his line. Monarchs are rarely ever elected, especially in the modern world. Instead, it is heredity that most often determines who will be the new ruler as the title is passed from father, the king or mother, the queen, to a son or daughter, the prince or princess. For example, when Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom dies, her son Charles, Prince of Wales, will inherit the throne. His oldest son, Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, is the next in line after Prince Charles. Although the responsibilities of today's monarchy differ from country to country, the way those responsibilities are decided on tend to fall into one of two categories absolute monarchies, and constitutional monarchies. In an absolute monarchy, also known as a despotic monarchy, the king, queen, emperor, or empress has unlimited power and authority within the country he or she rules. All decisions affecting the country are determined solely by the ruler. Currently, there are only five countries operating as traditional absolute monarchies around the globe with two more that have their own variation of an absolute monarchy system. However, today, in the much more common constitutional monarchy, the ruler acts as the head of state within a written, unwritten, or blended set of rules commonly referred to as a constitution. The power of the monarch in a constitutional monarchy is restrained by parliament, by law, or by custom. A constitutional monarch may work within a group of individuals within their country to rule their nation, or they may be more of a figurehead, a representative of their country to others around the world, but without much power to create rules or enforce them. With the exception of the Pope at the Vatican in Rome and a few countries in Asia and Africa like Saudi Arabia and Swaziland, most contemporary monarchies such as those in Great Britain, the Netherlands, Sweden, Australia, and Spain are constitutional monarchies. But more about that coming up. First, let's take a moment to review what we've learned so far. Question number one. What is the most ancient form of government in the world? A. Monarchy B. Constitutional government C. Democracy D. Dictatorship The correct answer is A. Monarchy is the most ancient form of government in the world. Question 2. When it's time for a new monarch, what is the most common way that the next monarch is chosen? A. Free elections B. Governmental overthrow C. Heredity inheritance or D. An act of Congress The answer is C. When it's time for a new monarch, the most common way that the next monarch is chosen is heredity inheritance. Question number three. Which of the following country's government is not an example of a monarchy? A. The Pope's rule at the Vatican B. Saudi Arabia, C, Great Britain, D, Switzerland. The correct answer is D. The country's government that is not an example of a monarchy is Switzerland, which is a federal republic. Make way for His Majesty the King. Your wish is my command, Your Royal Highness. You may hear phrases like this in a country led by a monarchy. In a monarchy, a king or a queen rules and makes all major decisions. 
the power of the kingdom is inherited and generally passes to the firstborn child. When you think of a country being led by a queen, what's the first country that comes to your mind? Could it be, mm, maybe England? Yep, England. England has a monarchy, and the head of the state is Queen Elizabeth II. However, her actual power is mostly symbolic, and despite all the glitz and glamour and pomp and drama of the royal family, the real power of England lies in its parliamentary democracy, a prime minister, and the parliament is made up of the House of Lords and House of Commons. These are the guys that really hammer out the legislation and laws. The people of the United Kingdom enjoy a high degree of liberty and freedom. An example of an absolute monarchy would be the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, ruled by King Salman and his word as it complies with the religion of Islam, is the law. And the people have very little or no influence or vote or voice in how the country is governed. As with many countries, ruled under a monarchy, the royal family lives a life of luxury while much of the rest of the country lives in poverty. Hear ye, hear ye. By decree of Her Majesty Queen Newscat, I will now explain to you monarchies. <coughs> That's a fitting way to start talking about kings and queens, right? When you think of monarchies, your mind might automatically go right to medieval times. Noble leaders protecting their people, or greedy, malicious conquerors who only look out for themselves. However, just like other forms of government, monarchies have gone through plenty of changes over the years, and still exist to this day. A monarchy is a form of government in which power and authority are held by one ruler or monarch for life. They usually get some help through a close-knit circle of family members and advisors. Way back in the day, a monarch would come to power through leadership achievements, such as conquering land and managing resources. They're supposed to rule that land with their people's best interests in mind. Once a monarch is set up, the power tends to pass from one generation to the next, from the king to his son, and from that son to the son's son, and so on and so forth. This means monarchs were usually born into the position rather than being chosen. <laughs> the Middle Ages shaped monarchies into what many know them as today. Heavily influenced by religion, kings acted as though they were chosen by a higher power to guard their people's well-being. There's even a name for it, the divine right of kings. If a monarch were to hold total and complete power on their own, this is known as an absolute monarch. You might be able to see where this could go wrong. One person with all the power? The idea of a monarchy is to have one leader that represents the people and acts in their best interests. But what if the person in charge has some ideals that the people don't like? Oh. Revolutions by the public have resulted in many monarchies changing into limited monarchies. There is still a monarch, but they don't get to decide absolutely everything. Today, the most well-known monarchy around is the British monarchy. It's one of those limited kinds, technically called a constitutional monarchy. So they still have a king or queen, but they also have a constitution that outlines the country's rules and laws. Some people have argued that it's time to do away with monarchies, but based on how the British love their leader, it seems like a government form that will be around with us for quite some time. What is a democracy and how does it work? We've already learned about two forms of government from around the globe. Now let's take a look at one that's a little closer to home. Let's look at democracy. A democratic government is one in which the people of the country, rather than a king, queen, emperor, or empress, make the necessary decisions on how that country will conduct itself. The word democracy comes from two Greek words, demos, which means the people, and kratia, which means power or authority. So in a democracy, all the power goes to the people. Simply put, a democracy is a form of government that functions on self-rule, as the citizens are the ultimate authority and create for themselves both the rules of the local and national government and the means to enforce them. Democracy dates at least to ancient Greece, 
often called the Cradle of Democracy, around 430 BCE, although there are places in India that claim to have started earlier. Some historians believe the oldest living democracy in the world is the Iroquois Native American Six Nations Confederacy, which has been in place for over 800 years. In a pure or direct democracy, every person gets an equal say as to the rules and regulations of a country. However, the only country today that is currently considered a direct democracy is Switzerland. Most democratic countries have representative forms of government. For example, in the United States, which has a republic democracy, individuals are elected to positions of authority by the citizens to represent their best interests on the national and local level, which the elected officials do by voting, because in a republic, the ultimate authority comes from the citizens and their vote. The two most common forms of democracy utilized today are parliamentary democracy, like in Great Britain, Australia, Canada, and India, and presidential democracy, like in the United States and France. For a democracy to work, citizens within them must participate in their own governance by creating political parties, engaging in political campaigns, and holding elections based on agreed upon rules. It becomes easy to see that in a democracy, the vote is the most powerful tool. Let's review. Question number one. What country is known as the cradle of democracy? A, the United States of America. B, Germany. C, Australia. D, Greece. The correct answer is D. Greece is known as the cradle of democracy. Question number two. What is necessary for a democracy to work? A, a hereditary ruler. B, citizen participation through political party campaigns and elections based on agreed upon rules. C, religious affiliation. D, judicial interpretation. The correct answer is B, citizen participation through political party campaigns and elections based on agreed upon rules are what is necessary for a democracy to work. Question number three. What is the most powerful tool of a democracy? A, the vote. B, the vote. C, the vote. D, all of the above. The correct answer is, of course, D, all of the above. This one might seem easy, but remember, Exercising their right to vote is the primary responsibility of all eligible citizens in a democracy, and it cannot work without it. Hey kids, have you ever asked yourself, what is democracy? You may have heard that term democracy. You may have also learned that the system of government that we have in the United States is called a democracy, and that being a democracy as an integral part of what makes the U.S. such a special place to live. But why? Why is being a democracy so special? And how exactly do democracies work? Well, think about it this way. Let's say you and your friends are hanging out on a Saturday morning, trying to decide what to do that day. Maybe someone wants to play soccer, and someone wants to play a board game, and perhaps a third friend suggests playing tag or diving into a board game. And maybe a fourth friend really wants to go to the mall. How do you decide what to do? Well, you could all discuss your options and come to a group decision. In that case, everyone would have a say, and the group would come to an agreement. That way, figuring out what to do is not just one person's decision, but everyone's. That's only fair, right? That's kind of how democracy works. In a democracy, the government is run by the people. The people who serve in the government are elected by a majority of the citizens, based on who they think are the best people to run the country. In addition to the president, the representatives of Congress, and the senators, who are elected members of the national government, there are also many, many local elections, in which citizens of towns, cities, states, and communities elect mayors, state representatives, council members, governors, judges, sheriffs, and others. Elections happen all the time in a democracy, and the winners are determined by whoever gets the most votes. In the United States, 
Everyone over 18 years old can vote for the various people who will represent them and their interests. While younger people can't vote, that doesn't mean you don't have a say. You can express your opinions to your parents, your friends, or your teachers. You can go to community events if there's something that you want to be changed or fixed. You can write letters to your representatives. You can protest in the streets for things you're passionate about. There are lots of things you can do. Just like everyone around you, in a democracy, you have free speech and can express your point of view so that people running for office can take into account what's important to you and those around you. Democracy can be best summed up in the phrase, one person, one vote, meaning that everyone's vote is as important as everyone else's. These days, with so many people, direct democracy is much more difficult. Can you imagine getting all 150 million people to vote at the same time for every little decision that needs to be made about the country? That would be almost impossible. This form of democracy is also sometimes called a democratic republic. In this type of government, people elect representatives that have the same opinions that they do in hopes that their interests will be reflected in the decisions made. The United States is a democratic republic. We elect people to vote on our behalf in Congress. So, what are some of the other common characteristics of democracies? In all democracies, there are free elections. This means everyone gets a secret vote, meaning they're free to vote for whoever or whatever is on the ballot, or even write someone else in, without interference from elected officials. In the United States, you must be 18 years old to vote. Most democracies also have term limits, meaning someone can't rule forever. The U.S. president can only serve for two terms. In some states, there are other rules about how long people can serve. Also, in a healthy democracy, every elected official is bound by something called checks and balances, meaning they can't abuse power because others in the government are making sure they don't. Finally, every democracy is made up of citizens. For a democracy to thrive and be successful, the citizens who live there must be willing to do their part which means they get involved, speak out, and most importantly, vote. They need to know who they're voting for, understand the issues, and voice their opinions. In this way, whatever is in the best interest of the people will be reflected in the people elected. So, in summary, why is democracy so great? Generally, people who live in a democracy have more freedom and rights than in countries that are not democracies. People in democracies usually have a higher standard of living, are better protected, and have the type of society they prefer. Of course, not everyone will always be happy with the decisions made in a democracy, and it's up to everyone to continue to try to improve the society by being informed and voting for the people they think will serve them best. When an election rolls around, people get a new chance to vote for the people they want to lead the country. Nobody should take democracy for granted. There are always some people who would prefer to have all the power for themselves. It's up to all of us, including you, to make sure democracy thrives, remains healthy, and continues long into the future.